Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again uh, for one of these author interview spotlight segments. Today we have with us the wonderful Robert M. Kearns. Robert, how are you today, sir? Oh, not too bad for a Monday, sir. How are you? Not too bad either. Uh, yeah, again, especially for a Monday, to your point. We're putting these segments together for you guys so you can, again, get more... Um, get to know the authors a little bit more of, you know, the fate, your favorite books, as well as to just learn a bit about authors that maybe you're interested in their books, but you just want to feel a little bit more comfortable for one reason or another, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. So Robert, we'll start with some simple questions and get into some more difficult ones further down the road. You know, the first one, what got you into writing? Like what, what made that you think, you know what, I'm going to do this. I have this thought in my head. I have to get it out. What, what was it? What was it? Well, I don't know how much traffic the books see now, um, but there, I, I may, I may start an argument with a certain subset <laughs> of the population by the end of this answer. When I was young, I got into mysteries like Hardy Boys, Sherlock Holmes, and all that. But by the time I reached my teens, they they just weren't satisfying for me. Nothing, you know, I'm not throwing any shade on the mystery genre or anything like that. I've started writing mysteries, but it just didn't work for me as well as it used to. And a, a distant cousin recommended David Eddings and Dragonlance. And I don't remember which one I picked up first. I have reread David Eddings, Belgariad, Malorian, the two prequels. Uh, Elenium, Tamuli, and Redemption of Alphalus. I've read those and reread them I don't know how many times. But what ultimately, if I had to pick one thing, one, one moment that started me on the path to publishing my own stories, it would be when I finished the Legends trilogy in Dragonlance, the second trilogy after uh, the the trilogy right after Chronicles that mm -hmm. follow mm -hmm. Aramon. I remember finishing the third book, and I always get the titles out of order. So if you would like that, feel free to look it up because I forgot to look it up prior to uh, getting ready for this. But I remember finishing the trilogy, sitting there on the edge of my bed, holding the third book in my hand because at that point in time, Kindle wasn't even a dream. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm pretty was, sure I have all these books in my uh, garage somewhere still. Nice. And uh, it was it was mass market paperback because, you know, there was no electronic. This was a mid-90s. The internet was a little better than telegraph. And I remember sitting on the edge of my bed holding the third book, looking at the last page and thinking to myself, you know, I don't like that ending. Now, don't get me wrong, the ending was appropriate to the trilogy. It, it for, for Raceland's story arc and the Legends trilogy, the ending was appropriate. I have no gripes about that. But for me, it just didn't work. And I decided I was going to try to do better. And I've been trying to do better ever since. Very good. Very good. I mean, it's a great starting point. All those old Forgotten Realms, like they were like the the thing for it's fun. It's cool to be a nerd today. Nerdy, <laughs> <laughs> nerdy kids that 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 mm -hmm. wanted that escapism, that wanted a bigger fantasy world, um, and they they were great. They were great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, man, Rasslin, dude, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that character in forever, um, but that's so good, so good. Random. Random fact about Raceland, if I may. Mm -hmm. Margaret Weiss, in she went back and wrote a duology. Uh, I can't remember if Tracy Hickman co wrote with her or not, mm -hmm. but she wrote the story of Raceland. In the opening, I want to say the first title was The Soul Forge. In the, in the intro to the book, she wrote that the characterization of Raceland came entirely from one person who was part of their beta te her their beta testing group at TSR. Wow. Because unlike unlike most of how it works today, mm -hmm. the novels came from the games. Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman were actually testers at TSR where they were developing this. And from what she wrote, the characterization of Raceland, 
she copied the uh, uh, the game testers portrayal of Raceland almost perfectly. That's amazing. You never know where you're going to get. It's just this creative material or the spark to be able to just run with, right? And to, and to literally flesh out an entire world around something, right? Mm-hmm. And that kind of gets, you know, brings us kind of to the next part of this is what was that catalyst specifically for the primogenitor series and your first book, Smilodon? What what was that catalyst? What, what was like that moment where you're like, God damn it, I have to write this book right now because it, I, I have a story to tell? Or, or was it something like that? Um, what led me to basically... Uh, set aside my other two series, Colin Shrex and Histories of Drakmore, to uh, write and publish Primogenitor series when I did. Um, number one, I couldn't get the story idea for Smilodon out of my head. It just would not leave me alone at all. And Smilodon grew out of, well, honestly, it grew out of wanting to read a shifter fantasy novel that I hadn't found anyone else writing. And honestly, if you, if someone is listening to this and wants to get into writing, the best thing they can do is find a story that they would love, that they would love to read that nobody else is writing and write that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What led to Primogenitor and my idea for Smilodon? Number one, I thought it would be cool to have a character who, uh, a shifter character who, um, whose animal was a prehistoric cat, a saber toothed cat. Mm-hmm. That that I don't know why. I'm by and large I'm a dog person, but I've always been fascinated <laughs> with big cats of the Pleistocene period, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. Alodons. I kept I I've I'm always on the hunt for good stories because. Honestly, it it ticks off at least three, at least two, possibly three. You know, continuing education, because <laughs> the best way to learn how to tell good stories is to read stories by other good writers. And number two, market research. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so my publishing pays for me to read books, and it's a tax write off. I mean, <laughs> can't get better than that, right? How can you? Yeah. How can you lose with that? But most shifter fantasy is either urban fantasy or paranormal romance. And I'm not throwing, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to feel like I'm throwing shade at paranormal romance at all. Uh, But often the authors treat it as romance with shifters or magic or whatever, Mm -hmm. just throwing flavor. And... I wasn't I wasn't able to find a shifter fantasy story that that was what I wanted to read. So when the idea of the uh, of the guy who turns into a prehistoric cat wouldn't get out, wouldn't leave me alone. I was like, well, you know what? You won't leave me alone. Heck with it. Um, <laughs> That's great. That's great. And so. Wyatt, specifically the main character, right? Your MC. Mm-hmm. Where did he come from? Do you, do, do you, does that, is that like somebody in your life or is that somebody, is that like a character that you're like, this guy's story really needs to be told because he's got X, Y, and Z traits? Like what, where did that, where did Wyatt stem from in conjunction with knowing you needed to tell this story for yourself? Honestly, the best way to create characters is not to base a character, an entire character on one person in your life. The best way to do it is just take little snippets here and there, because if you try to portray a person in your writing and like the person or the person's child or spouse or someone doesn't agree with your portrayal, <laughs> right. that, that, can, that, that can lead to some sticky situations, especially if, especially if it happens to be like a family member at a family reunion. <laughs> um, so why it, why it isn't really based on any specific uh, person. Um, for example, the the uh, his job at the start of Smilodon, mm-hmm. where he's uh, a tech at a, a dead end tech at a uh, software and web design firm. I I pretty much ripped that concept straight from my last IT job. 
Yeah. Uh, the names are different. The the setting is different. The the like uh, when Wyatt goes in and decides to quit, and and he goes in and he talks to the owner, and the owner's just this raging asshole. That has no connection to reality at all with my last I my very last or I guess I should say, should say final IT job no connection whatsoever because that's what I wanted for the story at that time but uh, yeah there's it, it's just uh, why it grew basically why it grew out of what I needed him to be to tell the story that's fair definitely fair definitely fair and I think that you know it resonates really well again with that kind of understanding that you just feel really don't feel fulfilled in life right and and needing something mm -hmm. more wanting something more and then getting something more but not necessarily what you were expecting <laughs> right <laughs> but it's great yeah that's right Wyatt definitely why it definitely went from the pool's parking lot to the deep end of the pool yeah. with no with nothing in between like bam here you go yeah yeah would you say, I know this is going to be kind of like a weird question, but do you think he's your favorite character either in the series or even in your, your wider works or, I mean, obviously they're all your babies, right? So that's, that's like, it's kind of hard. It's like your kids, right? Like what, pick your favorite kid. Come on. Let me. <laughs> well, I've, I've never actually, I've never actually felt that way about my stories. That's interesting. Uh, but I, I, I've got to admit, I, I love all my stories and is Wyatt my favorite? It's okay if he's not. Well, I've honestly never thought about it. Huh? I, uh, I, the first time I thought about it was when, uh, I read the questions that you, Oh, you uh, -huh. uh, huh. I never thought about that. Um, I, uh, the primogenitor world is a lot of fun and, mm -hmm. uh, a, I enjoy all of the the byplays and the byplay and the interactions and the the dynamics that have just kind of evolved. Yeah. Um so I don't know. I like I like each of my series I would say almost equally for different reasons. That's it. No, that's perfect. So the Primogenitor series now, as of right now, as of this very moment in time, um in June of 2022 is three books mm -hmm. long, right? You got Smile yep. book one, Rock book two, and Consular Times is the third book. Mm -hmm. How many more do we get? So this may sound a little weird and that's fine. I'm used to being the weirdo in the group. Sure. Um, I tend to think in fives and tens. Mm -hmm. Like uh, my epic fantasy series, Histories of Drakmore. Um, I... I have the story arc, the overall story arc for the series in my mind will be 10 books. Okay. And that was my original intent with Colin Shrek's as well. With Primogenitor, when Audiobook Guild first approached me for the audio rights, yeah. uh, part of that discussion was, well, how many books do you see in the series? And I said, uh, five to 10. And it to be to be to be 100 honest and the listeners will probably not enjoy hearing this <laughs> because it's ended and ambiguous i'll probably keep writing it till it's not fun anymore or i've told every i've told everything i can tell without recycling stuff yeah, yeah. i i really i have no problem with long-running series but I have problems where it seems like they, the writers hit a point where they just start recycling stuff from older books. That was largely my gripe with seasons one and two of Star Trek Voyager because mm -hmm. I threw every episode and just pick it out. It's like, okay, that piece episode, such and such, you know, just, just pick it apart from all of the other Star Trek series before it. So, as long as I can, as long as I can tell stories in primogenitor and be proud of the stories I tell and not feel like, not feel like I'm just throwing some artwork and a title out there for revenue. Yeah. I will probably still write them. That's Once I get the main storyline 
Well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to phrase it that way. Not a main storyline. Yeah. Prima Jenner is actually my first, uh, the first series where I didn't think out long term where I wanted the story to go. I started with the concept of this guy get this guy all of a sudden can find finds he's able to change into a prehistoric cat. Now run with it. <laughs> so um, eventually the the time between primogenitor novels is going to uh, increase a little bit once I get once I get somewhere to a, a respectable number. I'm thinking seven to eight. The time between the novels is going to expand because I've got some really fun ideas I want to write. And but as long as as long as as long as I can bring as long as what I write for primogenitor, like I was saying, is is fresh and interesting and I'm proud to put my name on it in public, I'll keep writing it. But there will be there will be at least at this point, there will be at least five to six. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I definitely love listening to it. And obviously, Christopher Boucher and, and Jessica Three oh, killed killed the narration. You know, they're they're so good. They're so good. Um, you know, as are you know, of course, all of the narrators that we work with on at Audio Wheel Guild. But um, you know, Chris, Chris, and Chris and Jess have really, I think, revolu- revolutionized kind of the, the dual narration aspect of of the business. I mm-hmm. think. Um, and, you know, really happy, you know, that they're on, on the series for you. What else do you go on, have going on? Anything else, you know, what, what are you writing right now? What, what are you working on? I am 18 chapters into the fall of Skull Keep, the fifth, uh, novel of history, the fifth book in histories of Drakmore. Uh, it is the end of the first story arc and, book six will start the second and final of that series. I'm not planning his, I'm not planning histories of Drakmore to go past 10 books <laughs> just because David Eddings wrote two quintets and two prequels. <laughs> I've toyed with the idea of once I finish uh-huh. you know, a couple of years after I finished the second five books of going back and writing like a duology or a trilogy uh, that tells the story. Uh, well, the, the, the major event in the histories of Drakmore is uh, is what I call the God's War. It was like 6,100 years in the past at the start of book one. Mm-hmm. I've toyed around with the idea of writing a prequel trilogy or duology that tells that story. I don't know if I'll do it. Okay. I've got some things I want to write. Yep. I don't know if I'll do that. <laughs> and, and the first book of that series is Awakening, correct? Correct. The first book is Awakening, and I learned a very good lesson with that series. Never title two books in the same series with words that start with the same letter. Half the time <laughs> I say Arch Magister when I mean Awakening, and sometimes I say Awakening when I mean Arch Magister. It's just... <laughs> And they're uh, my books. I mean, sure. I could kind of understand it if it was somebody else's books, but they're my books. You'd think I'd have that straight. <laughs> yeah. And, and everybody, obviously, Audiobook Guild is it only has um, the the one series. But if you're interested in all of Robert's books, you can go to Knights Fall. That's plural Knights Fall per, dot press, and get all of his uh, book information. Um, you go wide with all of your releases, right? So you're Correct. you're basically everywhere, right? Um, I am sh- the only the only sites that I am not on are the sites served by uh, Publish Drive and Streetlib. Publish Drive because there wasn't enough traffic to justify their subscription fee, and Streetlib because their website is just too frustrating. It's like <laughs> That's fair. out of the late '90s, early thousands. Yeah, I mean, it 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 made smash it makes smash words look advanced. <laughs> um, very good. Uh, anything else you want to tell the listeners before we go? So one of the things I've learned, or yeah, learned is a good word while writing primogenitor is that I should never put the title of the next book in 
the current book I'm finishing when I'm doing the formatting because I have an excellent idea for primogenitor number four that I'm going to run with. And when that book is published, the title will be Tempest. Oh, that sounds great. I'm already intrigued. And Miles will take a greater role in this one. Awesome. Uh, look, yeah, that's uh, look, really, really looking forward to that. that. He's a great character. Great, great character. I am extremely grateful for the overwhelmingly positive response to Primogenitor. I, I'm, it, how do I want to say it? I'm glad that people enjoy, t- uh, enjoy the stories that I enjoy writing. Very good. Very good. Well, we definitely enjoy them. Uh, I've listened to them all. Um, so I enjoy them. So there's that. Well, thank uh, you. I think that's worth, you know, at least a couple extra points. Uh, I might be biased though, but again, Robert, thank you again for coming on today. We really appreciate it. We really look forward to obviously getting more out of the primogenitor series, but, but again, you're, you're a great author in general and everybody should go check oh, you out you. again. Everybody, please go to nightsfall.press to see all the stuff that uh, Robert has to offer obviously by everything that we have as well. Um, (laughs) So again, Robert, thank you again. And it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. Well, I'm sure we'll have you back again.